And we're back with another episode of the Lakers Fast Break Podcast. It's Gerald Glass. We're coming right back at you here from Lakers Fast Break. Pop culture comments, game source, inside sports, fantasy football, and of course, the Lakers Fast Break. We truly appreciate everyone out there listening to all of our great shows. And if you can, please give us that five star review upon leaving today's class, wherever you get your podcasts. Plus, if you can like, share, subscribe, follow, or do whatever it is that you can to support us right here at the Lakers Fast Break, Pop Culture Cosmos, Game Source, Inside Sports Fantasy Football, the great folks at LakersBall.com. Go ahead and check out one of our awesome professors, Professor Ox 1947, as he holds separate lectures <laughs> quite frequently at lakersball.com <laughs> plus if you can our frequent stops at playback.tv slash lakers fast break you will see the finest in lectures and discussions as the faculty themselves of sean nick joe and whoever else stops by we always contemplate our subjects including the lakers and the nba each and every game Right there for you at playback.tv slash Lakers Fast Break. Plus, our friends at Lakerholics.com. Go ahead and hit up fellow colleagues of ours, Jamie Sweet and Laker Tom at Lakerholics.com. And if you want your lawn transformed into something much more beautiful than it is today, and you live in the Southern California area, please go ahead and attend if you can. Simblades, Simblades with a Y.com. Plus, are Good friends of the Hoopheads Podcast Network. And if you can support all of that, the Lakers Fast Break University would sincerely appreciate it. Well, we're back after our holiday break for another scintillating lecture on the Los Angeles Lakers as part of our Lakers History 101. And me as the Dean of Lakers Fast Break University, Gerald Glassford, I truly appreciate everyone attending class so promptly, attending class and being part of what we're doing here at the Lakers Fast Break. We are holding today's lecture as a way of giving back to the community and the learning institution that we are. And today's class is in session. You see in the background, the students are ready. They've got their computers out. Most of them are Macintosh, <laughs> which blows my mind because PC is better. But I will say nonetheless that they are ready to go ahead and take down notes because the 2012 Lakers are on the mind. As my good friend TJ Johnson suggested this to us as a topic for today's discussion, I have two outstanding professors here to discuss the promise of the 2012 Lakers and what went wrong with the 2012 Lakers. Because boy, did it all go wrong? But here today to talk about today's lecture, two awesome professors indeed. If you get a chance, please go ahead and check out Ox1947 as he conducts many courses at LakersBall.com. It is Professor Joe Sorrow and of course also as well, the madman from Toronto, getting out of Toronto traffic, getting out of his own university troubles at various <laughs> points in the Toronto landscape. He's a good man indeed. you got to go ahead and check him out whenever he's here. It is the magic man, Professor Sean Grice as well. And class is now in session. Joe Sorrell, I will start with you, Professor. Good to have you here. And Daniel, that is incorrect statement, please. I will have to go ahead and and uh, see about your academic suspension with that kind of susp with that kind of statement. So please refrain from such, you know, nasty verbiage. Even though the Lakers do kind of have been sucking lately, losing two in a row. You know, can't say I blame you on that. But <laughs> Professor Soro, the 2012 Lakers are a enigma to say the least. Mm -hmm. There was so much promise. So much promise. The new TV contract was coming in. I believe it was initially a 20-year, $3 billion contract. That might have changed over the years. Uh, there was some back and forth on whether Dwight Howard wanted to be a Laker. Dwight Howard wanted to go to Brooklyn. 
from a lot of the rumors we heard. He did not want to come to LA, but it wasn't it wasn't something that was talked about too much. Just that he preferred not to go to LA, but the way the four team trade ended up going about, he had to go to LA. Uh, as the years went by, we we I, I finally understood what what that meant, and the reason why Dwight didn't want to be a Laker was Kobe Bryant. Kobe Bryant put you on a level that very few can can catch. And at this time, everybody kisses Kobe's rear end when he's retiring, scoring 60, all that stuff. Everybody's all revisionist history, all prisoners of the moment. But in 2012, in 2014, uh, you know, Kobe Bryant was considered a kind of a pariah for people to come play in LA because of the personality. And Dwight Howard was that last great player in his prime still that kind of backed that up. So Dwight Howard gets acquired. We give up, I believe, four first round draft picks for Steve Nash. We have Meta World Peace. Uh, I had forgotten we had Antoine Jameson. Thanks for the reminder, Sean. And a motivated Kobe Bryant trying to get his sixth title. And again, the TV, the new TV deal where the Lakers had their own channel. So I remember talking about it that summer saying, this is going to be one of those seasons where we are going to want to watch every minute, even those dreadful January and February games against the Midwest teams like Minnesota and Milwaukee. Do you remember heading into the season when they were all appeared, or at least the, the main cogs of the team appeared on that SI cover? Yes. Uh, to, it was it was Dwight Howard and Steve Nash on the cover, mm -hmm. actually. Uh, with Kobe, correct, I believe. Uh Kobe wasn't on there. Kobe was on? Okay. No, it was just it was just Dwight Howard and Nash. And I was excited because I, I really thought that they were going to be a contender. And the fact that the Miami Heat were the champs, LeBron was finally got his title, I thought, man, what a way to kind of slap LeBron back is in, in, in having him to deal – yeah, in him having to have to deal with Kobe and a revamped roster, um, especially considering Miami – Although, you know, we're we're showing signs of dominance throughout the year. They still needed seven games to beat an old Boston team to get past the East and then swept, or I should say uh, backdoor swept the Oklahoma City Thunder because James Harden uh, delivered probably one of the big choke jobs that you could you could have. If James Harden plays just normal. Average, Oklahoma, yeah. Yeah, I think Oklahoma City probably takes that title, but you know, again, that's 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 a discussion for another time. But we go in. I we were going into that season, obviously being title contenders. Seventy wins were talked about several times, and I was hook, line, and sinker on that one. I was really, 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 really happy about it because I thought, my God, Kobe's going to be able to do what he wants. Nash is going to be able to distribute, and. Dwight Howard's going to pretty much close the lane off for any bums to come through. Boy, did that – was that wrong? <laughs> it was a team that had so much promise. Well, so here's – here's – here's a – here's me defending Mike Brown. Mm. Uh, Who's doing a good job now with Sacramento. Mike Brown – coached a hell of a season the year before. And the Lakers, specifically Powell and Kobe, lost us that Oklahoma City Thunder series. There were a couple games that Kobe and Gasol made some catastrophic plays that cost us 
those games. I thought Mike Brown, Snyder, all the boys were out coaching. Uh, I believe it was Brooks. I uh, forgot his first name. Uh, Scott Brooks? Scott Brooks. He out coached. He was out coaching Scott Brooks all the way up and down the court, except the problem was Kobe and Gasol just did not. They almost kind of turned into LeBron and the Lakers last night. They they didn't play that well. Um, when the season ended, I started thinking to myself, I go, I can see how Powell's kind of starting to come down. We saw that. That's why Mitch made that trade for CP3 when he did, because he, he you want to get rid of a guy. I, I know this sounds mean, but you want to get rid of a guy before he gets bad. You're almost like he's still good, just so you can catch up to it. Powell was pretty much done after the 12, 2012 season. He was really done after that kind of just – that just not it wasn't a choke job, just a bad job in 2011 against Dallas. But he was really kind of getting done around 2012. So we go into that season and we go 0 and 8, 0 and 8 in the preseason. It's just a, it's just almost exactly like what happened this year and last year, I should say where we're not winning anything. And I, I'm saying, what is going on here? You can't win one freaking preseason game? What? And then they go into the first five games of the year, and then Mike Brown, get at, Mike Brown gets axed. Mike Brown gets axed. He's the scapegoat. He's done. Now we got to go find a coach. Well, Phil Jackson gets a call again. Phil Jackson had said previously that he wasn't feeling the Cleveland trips anymore and Milwaukee trips and the back-to-backs and riding back and forth and da-da-da-da-da. There was some talk of him maybe just doing the home Split games. Split coaching. Yeah, and having Kurt Rambis be the road coach, which was absolutely ridiculous, by the way. Uh, I, I, even then, I was like, what the freak are you guys talking about? <laughs> that was that word. It doesn't work like that. Um, and Jim Buss and Mitch were trying to figure out what was going on with that. And a lot of the uh, – actually, Ben, uh, uh, Jamie, it's it was uh, tapes, videotapes. He was known for his videotapes. Um, so – I'm thinking we're, you know, a lot of the noises we're getting Phil Jackson again. And now I'm starting to get a little excited because I think Phil Jackson can kind of mend whatever the issues were because he's Phil Jackson. And Kobe would feel real comfortable doing what he's doing. All of a sudden, out of nowhere, I see, I hear Mike D'Antoni is the new coach. And from there, I'm going to pass it on to Sean so he can continue from there. <laughs> thanks so much for listening to the lakers fast break it is lakers history 101 what happened with the 2012 los angeles lakers a team so filled with promise so many big names so many future hall of famers on the list what happened and what went wrong just heard from professor joe soro it is now time to hear from the madman from Toronto, the, ma- the guy that just can't get out of Toronto traffic. It is the magic man, Professor Sean Grice. And Sean, you saw the point where Joe wants to go ahead and take the class. Go ahead and take us on to continue the journey of the 2012 Los Angeles Lakers. Uh, absolutely, Gerald. So uh, we get the news that uh, Phil Jackson has been uh, contemplating whether or not he wants to come back. And um, through the fog in the morning, we find out that actually they've hired Mike D'Antoni. They've decided to either pull or rescind or have uh, second thoughts about uh, offering Phil the head coaching job. And they offered it to Mike D'Antoni, who uh, at the time, uh, I believe, and I'm quoting him here, he was eating Jello pudding on uh, a mattress at a YMCA uh, in New York City when he got the call that uh, he was offered the job for the Lakers. Um, 
that had a lot to do with Steve Nash. D'Antoni and Nash had a previous relationship. Uh, Kobe and D'Antoni also had a previous relationship. However, they, while well, neither of them coached or played, uh, Kobe recalls that when his father played professionally in Italy, that Mike D'Antoni was on the same team and he became a fan of his uh, as a basketball fan. So he has immense respect for Mike D'Antoni. Um, moving forward, uh, I'm conflicted about that move as a fan because I'm just, I'm not convinced that Mike D'Antoni is the guy to lead this team to a championship. At the time, we are considered a dark horse contender if things break, break our way. Uh, but you're dealing with a roster that is both flawed and accomplished, as Gerald said. The backcourt is Steve Nash, Kobe Bryant, Jody Meeks, Chris Duhon. You also have in the front court Meta World Peace. You have Pau Gasol, Antoine Jameson, Dwight Howard. Dwight Howard has a, a serious back injury. Uh, at the time, um, there was a lot of pressure for Dwight and and Steve, especially Gerald, as you uh, brought up the SI cover, which was titled, This is Going to Be Fun. Uh, it wasn't fun for us at the end of the year, that's for sure. Um, so Mike D'Antoni is installed as a coach. And we actually have a uh, little success while Bernie Bickerstaff is our coach, which is kind of a surprise, right? Because now fan fans were saying, "Oh, wait a minute, maybe Bernie should be the coach." Well, no that that was that was never realistic, but he was the placeholder at that time. And Gerald, we we move forward with the Mike D'Antoni offense, and um, uh, I remember Max Kellerman during that year um, basically called uh, Mike D'Antoni Mike uh, D'Antoni because he said there at one point there was actually no O in the offense, and then he went from Anthony to just Anthony because Mike. <laughs> D'Antoni found a way to suck the life out of the Lakers on offense and defense. Uh, he basically runs Kobe into the ground because we have no choice. Uh, Dwight is hurt periodically. His his back is not 100%. Uh, as we look back, Jeannie Buss, Dwight Howard, Mitch Kupchak, Jim Buss, they've all said the same thing. It would have probably been in Dwight's best interest if he had not played in the first half of the season after having that back surgery so late in the summer. But he put it upon himself that he needed to suit up and uh, give the Lakers and the fans all he could. And uh, he just wasn't the same offensive player that he had been in the past, Gerald. And... Um, because of, unfortunately, Steve Nash's injury, injuries, um, Mike D'Antoni can't get a foothold on his offense because he's basically run a pick-and-roll offense for 40 years as a coach, and he doesn't have his golden boy anymore because Nash is hurt. So it's a running rotation of basically... Kobe being the primary ball ball handler. And, you know, it's either Steve Nash, uh, or, excuse me, Steve Blake, or Jody Meeks in the backcourt with them. And, of course, you know, Steve Blake was, was a really good shooter, but a, a, a small guard uh, as well. Jody Meeks, a, Jody Meeks a small, small guard. Um, so it's difficult for us to, to try and get any kind of momentum defensively at all. It just, it, but Dwight 
we had Dwight and we had a couple other players at times, like as much as Joe says, Powell was, in, Powell was on the decline. So was Meta as well. Um, he wasn't the same um, just feisty, intense defender that he used to be. The, the lateral quickness wasn't there at all. So we're, we're sputtering through the first half of the season. We're basically, we're an eighth, ninth, tenth seed. We're trying our hardest. And then April comes along, and Joe, leave the conch to you, man. So I ask you here, when it comes to, again, the 2012 Lakers, a team filled with so much promise, so many big names, and so many individuals out there who thought that this team was – just on paper, it looked like the Lakers were just going to run away and hide with the Western Conference. And – you know, surely get to the NBA finals. No doubt about it. Every, everybody in LA, every, yeah. well, I was just going to say that the mood and the beat, everybody with LA was excited. Southern well, California was just anticipating another ring on there. Go ahead, Sean. Yeah, no, Gerald, absolutely. And if you, if you look back at um, basically all the prognostications, there wasn't, there wasn't a single publication that had the Lakers not winning more than, than 50 games. Yeah. It was, it was, unforeseen that they would somehow you know meet, win 45 no like that this team was supposed to be a contender and how could a team with four possibly five depending on your definition of ron artest meta slash metal world peace how could that go wrong joe so i ask you you saw and were a big part of the fan base in 2012 watching this team excited for what was going to happen you could start seeing the signs starting with the Nash injury early on. It was starting to not go as planned. In essence, what went wrong with the 2012 Los Angeles Lakers? I, I base it off bad timing. We got Nash, I mean, on his last leg, just at the perfect time. Dwight Howard hit his first major injury, back injury for a guy who could jump out the building. Now you don't have that. Kobe Bryant trying to get one last run in, needed help, needed a little bit of assistance throughout the regular season so that he could do his thing in the end. A lot, very similar to kind of what's going on with LeBron right now, where you, we're trying to get this team right so that he can use this last few years of what's what, what talent is left. Uh, Ron was, was pretty much done. Uh, maybe a little bit more done than Powell. Uh, the guys like Steve Blake, Duhan, and all those guys, you know, they were perfect role players that, you know, weren't going to be able to handle picking up the slack on that team. Plus, you you had a lot of just um, nonsensical, non nonsens nonsensical drama uh, that just grown adults acting like children uh, in, and in and around. And Mike D'Antoni didn't really help that either. He had a he kind of has a little bit of a temperament issue as well. Uh, Phil Jackson not making a decision right away, I think, was ultimately – this is my theory. This is not anything that I read uh, other than f figuring out what was going on. Um, I think Jim Buss just got impatient with Phil and said, you know what, I'm just going to make a decision now. Phil should have said yes or no at the beginning instead of doing what Phil does, but then Phil wouldn't be what he is if, if, if he wasn't Phil. Uh, Mitch is kind of the good soldier, good lieutenant. He's going to listen to direction. He's not going to ruffle feathers. That's that's just kind of how he is. Uh, and Kobe Bryant uh, essentially said after, what was it, 30 and 30 after 60 games? We were 30 and 30 after 60 games. And Kobe pretty much said, I'm playing every minute of the game. Now, we're so used to Kobe being Superman, I didn't think anything of it. Uh, and then when I saw him slip in the Golden State game towards the end there, um, I don't think I thought it was an Achilles until Stu said that looked like an Achilles. And I said, oh, shit. And it was. And at that point, I knew that Kobe's career was over. Um, not officially, but what we knew of Kobe was over. And 
we got pretty much waxed by the Spurs in the first round with Dwight Howard pretty much by the minute aggravating every Laker fan on the planet to the point where we we're not really sure if we wanted him back. We wanted him back because we didn't want to lose him for nothing. But a lot, a lot of at least me was thinking, is this the guy we we want? I still want him here, but is this guy going to work? And he would. That was, that eight was years the, later. <laughs> that that was the worst backcourt uh, in NBA history: Darius Morris and Andrew Gaudelock. God bless them both. God bless them both. But that was the worst backcourt in NBA playoff history. So I ask you guys, as has been pointed out, and appreciate the the thoughts of Empire Jeff TV, the back half of the season, once the Lakers were getting back into some sort of semblance of health, although as has been noted out, uh, you know, Dwight Howard has an injury, which he kept hiding. And of course, Steve Nash had that injury that affected him pretty much the entire season because he was out for a large chunk of it. Your thoughts on what could have been with this team had it been, uh, you know, where did it all go wrong? Because again, for a period of time, Joe and Sean, this team was very, very good. I'd say it could have gone right if they could have found a way to work with Mike Brown. When that happened, it was, it just was a broken team. Mike D'Antoni needs a certain, he needs certain tools. He can't, he can't have, the guy's going to cook one way and and, and that's it. There is no, any other, there's no other way he's going to cook. So you gave Mike D'Antoni recipes and, 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 and uh, utensils that were not going to work for his system. You don't give a seven seconds or less offense uh, Dwight Howard. Dwight Howard can't shoot. He can't really split, spread the floor. He is uh, he was the last line of, of what the old NBA used to be. I'd say if there was a time where we can kind of point to on when that started to shift, it was that year. And that's where the and that's where the fissure started with him as a coach. Dwight Howard at that time was the best pick and roll uh, monster in the NBA. Whether he was lo- getting a lob or off off the roll, and he had the ball and he was slamming it home, he was the best pick and roll option. And that and Mike D'Antoni knew it too. But like Joe said, Dwight Howard said that he no longer wanted to be a pick and roll basketball player. Which is a shame because you saw in Phoenix how Steve Nash utilized and Amari Stoudemire, Stoudemire were, were just monsters. Stat was yeah. a monster. Um, he owes pretty much every All Star selection to uh, Gatsby. Um, yeah, Gerald. If you're Dwight Howard in that moment in time, and you're thinking, "Damn, I've got Steve Nash, and I've got one of the best pick and roll." minds ever on the court and s- standing on the bench but i'm going to decide that no i want to be an isolation player now because i've won a couple mvps and i've won a couple defensive player of the year awards and i think i'm better than what people suggest i am even though dwight never developed a go to move there's not one move that Howard has that anybody could say, yep, that's Dwight Howard. He 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 didn't learn counters un- un- until until he was well into his Houston uh days. Um he would he w- and as Joe said, it was kind of a bad mix from the start because at the time Howard's 26 He's not really as self-reflective as Nash and Kobe are right now, being in their mid thirties. Um, so it, it it just seemed like the locker room had these different clicks as well, and that and that's something that needs to either be um, um, regulated by the by the leadership or the coaching staff. And like Joe said, 
D'Antoni was never the kind of guy to basically try and insert himself into conflict to try and cool down the temperature like a Riles or a Phil Jackson or a, even a Greg Popovich would. D'Antoni's more uh, passive aggressive. Um, you, you know, the best example of Mike D'Antoni's passive aggressiveness was benching Powell. That was that was another fissure that uh, kind of pissed a lot of people off. Um, what do you guys feel about that? Well, I, I heard a interview recently, maybe about a year ago, about how Kobe had been talking to Dwight before the season started. And I'll paraphrase in that Dwight Howard talked more about wanting to have fun than being, I don't know, I guess professional driven, mode. Be, 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 instead of being driven to do to, to the ultimate goal. And when Dwight left the room, uh, Kobe said, this isn't the guy. So if you want to point to something that we watched, we could point, I can point to the fact that they're not going to listen to the coach. They weren't listening to Mike Brown, which was just a bad way to start the year. Now we've seen teams win championships without the, the, the starting coach, uh, so we kind of, I kind of looked back on that and said, okay, well, maybe it could be a, a Pat Riley situation twice. <laughs> um, and it's the Lakers, uh, even though Miami, Pat did it the second time in Miami. Uh, but a little bit of me said that there was something disconnected with, 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 with just, it was just a perfect storm of bad. It wasn't everyone's fault, but it was a lot of their fault. And, the part that wasn't their fault was just Nash hitting the wall when he did, uh, Howard not being healthy, and really the rest of the guys kind of uh, just on the downturn of their careers, which gets me back to my initial anger about what happened two years earlier, which is the veto. The Lakers had a plan. They were trying to execute it, and they got – Half of it. They got derailed by it. They got derailed in doing that, and that was the result. They were trying to patch it. They were trying to patch those holes with uh, with those band aids that don't stick after two minutes. And and it's just it's it it was an culmination of really Kobe's career at that point. I go, yep, Kobe's never going to have a chance to get number six, and he was never given the chance to get number six. In so many ways, in so many ways, and we talk about the greatest players and all this stuff. And I, I, and who who was given the red carpet versus those who had to fight through, not other teams, but actual the actual executives of the NBA that that ruined their chances at being uh, bigger than what they are, even though they are already big. It's 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 a lot of angst. It's a lot of frustration. Uh, no one's going to feel sorry for us because we're, you know, six championships in 22 years. But I don't look at it that way. I look at it as, well, it took an entire league to stop the Lakers more than once. And the result, the end result is this. And it reminds me also of the Dodgers and how the league didn't do anything to Houston or Boston. And the Dodgers haven't really ever recovered from that either. So, uh, the twenty the 2012 season, the 2012-13 season, will always be remembered as the Achilles year. Uh, but there was a a, a work up to that, and the there, there there are so many snapshots from that season that that it almost it's almost like the penultimate season without it that that's not a championship year that you look back and see all these snapshots, the sports illustrated cover, the Kobe death stare. I got to answer this question. Uh, yeah, gen- well, that's gentleman- a question for the panel. I want Lifted. to go ahead and make sure. Yeah. Lifted. Great question. Great question. Uh, Would Phil Jackson in 2012 made any difference? <sighs> wow. I've been thinking about that since I read it. I think I 
I know Phil Jackson would not have allowed Kobe to play 48 minutes a game. No. What happens after that is up for debate because Phil Jackson also couldn't control what was going on that last year he coached. A lot of people don't remember the 2011 season other than losing the Mavericks in a sweep. There was some inner turmoil going on in the team. Certain individuals tapping into waters that they shouldn't have been tapping into, stuff that was personal. I would say this. I would say I think he would, but I think it would have taken about 40 or 50 games because as much as info as he has on Kobe and Powell and Meta, uh, I think it would have taken some adjustments with Steve Nash in the triangle. But also I don't know. as well, you got to consider how would he have handled Dwight? You know, yes. yes, Dwight was injured, but you heard and you, yeah, I spoke of about his desire to go ahead and play a different way than what he was best suited for. Would Phil have been able to tap into some way and convince Dwight that maybe the way he was playing was a better way? Uh, no, Phil doesn't do that. I, I think I think at that point Dwight was too too um, emotionally immature. Mm -hmm. I, I would say to listen to what Phil was really trying to tell him. It's it's really a weird a weird question to answer because. I could we could sit here and say, well, he would have probably told management to trade Dwight Howard the dread deadline because mm -hmm. he wasn't going to do anything. And yeah. Kobe already confirmed during, before the season started that this guy's not the guy. So he could have said, hey, we need to trade this guy for somebody else. And there was a lot of noise about him going to the, the Warriors. And I think we could have gotten Clay for Dwight at that point. I'm just saying, and I it's one of the great things about Gerald setting up this this particular segment show is it, it starts to you start the to remember ifs. things the what ifs right and that's always something fun to do what ifs so there was talk of him going to Golden State before he saw he got traded to LA and I think he wanted to play he would have loved to have played with someone like Steph Curry because Steph Curry is a no you know he can play with anybody Again, it's a trait that no one talks about enough that Steph Curry is not only a great basketball player, but he is probably one of the best in terms of flow with any ego or any player on his team. He never let noises bother him. Like, mm -mm. are you going to do this? Or this guy is second fiddle? Or is it? He never. And that is something, if someone was to ask me, what, what do you say about Steph Curry? Steph Curry is... The, the perimeter version of Tim Duncan, if not better, if not better, in terms of understanding and not letting the outside noise bother the team, even though he's a star. So now if you trade the white for more shooters, now D'Antoni's offense gets really interesting. There's so many ways this could have gone, but I don't want to – it's easy. It's always easy to say, oh, it would have been better. No. I don't think that's the case. I think the only thing I can guarantee is that Kobe would not have played as many minutes as he did, but he'd still have to deal with a Pau Gasol that was going downhill, Meta going downhill, Nash playing on one leg, and really role players that really wouldn't be able to pick up the slack. They did play better towards the, towards the end of the year. The, the only role player that year that really played consistently and – Quite honestly, it, it was the guy you kind of had the most, I would guess, um, sympathy for on that team was Antoine Jameson because he was at the end of his career too. But he could still pop you 15 points and shoot from a fairly effective percentage. But like Joe was saying, with Pow in and out of the lineup, Dwight in and out of the lineup, Nash on one leg. There was just never any rotational consistency. One of the things I want to go ahead and touch on before we head on out and class will be over is the fallout from the 2012 Lakers. So, guys, I want to ask you, in the years following, you saw the breakup, you saw the trades, you saw the, the ways that the team tried to get out of the failed experiment known as the 2012 Lakers. 
We saw what happened with Kobe and how he finished his career once he came back from the injury. We saw how Dwight Howard left disgraced and a persona non grata to Lakers fans, one of the most despised Lakers players ever, only to come back when we needed him the most and help guide us playing tremendously off the bench and guiding us along with LeBron, AD, and the rest of the crew to a world championship victory in the bubble in 2020. We saw what happened to Meta World Peace in the end of his career. Steve Nash, the same. Most of those players never achieved anywhere near the heights of what we saw in the preceding years before 2012. Let me hear you guys' thoughts on, on what happened to these players in the preceding, or excuse me, in the following years, in the following years after 2012. Yeah, Gerald. Um, so, Powell leaves the Lakers. Um, he goes on and uh, signs with the Chicago Bulls. Um, has a bit of a comeback season, um, but he's still not the same player he is. Um, basically bounces around. Um, eventually finishes career in San Antonio. Uh, Dwight, as Gerald said, Dwight is probably the most um, ironic that he was the most successful after that team ended. Yes, of all of all of the players, Dwight turns out, and it comes full circle that he wins a championship with the team he spurned um, and scorned. Basically, uh, Dwight left uh, no stone unturned as far as scorching the earth with the Lakers and the, the feeling was that there is no way, no way Were you mad when he wanted to come back on the team and eventually came back on the team. You know, I have to admit something, Gerald, uh, ju just because of, just because of my loyalty to the purple and gold, I was a little bit, I have to admit, I was a little, I was a little cheesed at that, but, um, I, I believed in Dwight's sincerity that he wanted to come back and and come off the bench and play the role that uh, he's expected to play, and he did it. Um, uh, we were all impressed with Dwight's maturity in the in the Houston Rockets series when he's basically not playing a minute during any of it, but he's intently watching all the action. Um, he's being a good teammate. And it was quite the the inversion from the guy who was basically disinterested in anything that didn't involve a conversation about himself in 2012. And moving on, you know, basically Meta flutters out of the NBA. Um, Kobe begins or begins what seems like a never ending rehab for the rest of his NBA career. Um, Dan Tony decide decides that well, you know, maybe the grass is greener. You know, I did my best here, and we know what happened with him. Um, my God, Jordan Hill becomes becomes a key player for the Lakers uh, that following year, and so does Robert Sacre. And oh my goodness, the Robert was... Sacre era. Yes, yes, we entered the Sacre Bleu era, and you know, just the fall, just like you said, Gerald, the fallout from that. There, there's so many. It was like a giant earthquake that had so many seismic changes. Well, I will say it's been a great session so far, but before we head on out. Joe, I want you to go ahead and touch on your thoughts on, well, did we learn anything as a team, as an organization, as, uh, you know, maybe, were there any lessons to be learned? I mean, when you try to assemble all that talent, most of it beyond its prime, usually, as we've seen, it's a recipe for disaster. And we saw them try to do it again. So did they really learn from their example? In 2012, I don't compare what they try to do in 2012 to what they've done recently. They were they were trying to 
bring in enough talent to win a championship. And Dwight Howard was arguably the best center at that point in the league. I don't even think arguing is it is 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 really an argument. He was. Um, he was a guy that didn't demand the ball in terms of offensively. I mean, he wanted to score, but he wasn't going to dominate that. Um, Nash, we thought we could get maybe a another year or two from him so he, you can have your point guard to alleviate Kobe from having so much ball control throughout, throughout the season. I don't look back at that time and not and go, wow, they made a mistake in, in, in putting this together. No, absolutely not. They, they did their best to try to see if these guys can put it together. And they, they did to some degree, they kind of figured it out. They, I think they finished 26 and 13 after mm -hmm. that slow start. And maybe they make it to the second round or the, Western Conference Finals playing that way. I don't know if they would win it all, but they would have definitely not have been swept by the Spurs if Kobe was playing. So it was a, a it was an culmination of everything that could go bad went bad, and it, the worst part of it was Kobe blowing out his Achilles because that was a career ender for him. Even though he still was functional with it, it just was Kobe played too hard, too long. For him not to eventually crap out the way he did, his shoulder, his knees, his 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 Achilles. It didn't matter what it was. You you, I always say Kobe Ryan, Troy Polamalu, were were always on borrowed time. The fact that they lasted as long as they did was a testament to their dedication to their craft and their preparation, and they 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 left nothing there. How can you fault them for that? How can you sit there and go, oh, if you had just done this? No, I'd rather watch Kobe Bryant do what he did in, in 14 years than, than watch him be a, a secondary guy for 20 years. And I and Kobe knows that too. Kobe, the only reason why Kobe retired is because he couldn't do it anymore. His body wasn't saying yes anymore. Uh, my only frustration that year was the fact that we – we knew it was over for number six for Kobe. After that, okay, guys, it's time to rebuild. Well, <laughs> I've been around since, you know, I've been watching the game since 91 when, when Magic had just retired. So I had been through a rebuild then, and that those mid-'90s teams made it very, very nice in between that and Shaq and Kobe arriving. And I, I still thank them for that because – they were a very fun team. They played their hearts out and have a lot of respect for Nikki V, Vlade at that time, and Terry Teagle and Sidel Three. I, I, I'm telling you, man, those guys, they won some games in the playoffs they shouldn't have won, and they did. Shout out to Eldon Campbell. Yes. Uh, uh, Eldon, I didn't mention Eldon for a reason because I felt Eldon was the only guy during that era was, that was lazy. He was the one that just did not – he was so skilled and so talented, but he could he just mentally didn't have it. Uh, and then you fast forward to the, the dead year of 2005. And I don't know if that's necessarily a rebuild. I mean, you could say 05, 06, 07 was the rebuild. I didn't know what to call 06 and 07. I was just focusing on Kobe's run in those two years. It was astronomical what he was doing in those two years. Uh, then we got back into contention in 08. And then back-to-back -back championships, and then was hoping for a three-peat in, in 11. Uh, but two years later, we're down to that last spot, the last chance to get that team, but it crashed and burned. And you can't fault the Lakers for not trying each and every time. And my thing is, if you give your effort, if you're trying to do something, I'm going to back you up, even if it doesn't work out. And that's one of those times where, 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 where they were trying to do it and they couldn't do it. Now, I don't know what they're doing now. I don't know what their philosophy is. I don't know what their identity is. But at the same time, it's the same problem, guys. It's, it's, if, you're, if your guys are not healthy, it's always going to make the transactions and the executive decisions worse. And that's, that's, that's if you want to go full circle on that, from then and now, 
that's pretty much where we are. It's just they're they're not trying to fix these things anymore. It's it's they're focused on money. They're focused on changing uh, arena names because they need money, and they're focused on salary cap issues, which they've always w- were money conscious. That's that's not I'm not saying they weren't doing that with Doctor Bus, but Doctor Bus always said the same thing every time. If we are going to do this, it's got to be to win the championship. So that's it. Once again, it's the Lakers fast break. Lakers History 101 is closing its session here. The class is almost done, but we truly appreciate it. If you have any feedback, questions, oh, or yeah, uh, Blue Magic. Ask- so, so Blue Magic. Sorry, Gerald. I have to. I have to reiterate this, even though I've no problem. About the first, Yes. So, so Blue Magic. I think the media largely demonized Kobe around that time. We didn't hear many superstars clamoring to join Kobe. You are not wrong. This is something I've been trying to highlight. All these ass kissers of Kobe. I'm not talking about since he passed away. That's different. I'm talking before he passed away. Everyone was in love with Kobe. Kobe this, Kobe that. And I'm the guy. I'm the a hole, right? I'm always the a hole that's got the truth in the corner. Like I'm sitting there going, weren't you the one saying that he was a cancer? That no one wanted to come play in LA with him? Well, I I found I found I found this dichotomy really, really interesting. In um in 2010, I remember coming home from work and hearing that Ron Artest is going to sign with the Cleveland Cavaliers. Set. It's it's at the goal line. He's going to sign with the Cleveland Cavaliers. So Ron's made the decision because the the decision came down to is does Ron want to play with Kobe or does Ron want to play with LeBron? Because he wasn't going back to Houston at that point. It was a done deal. He was either going to Cleveland or he's going to L.A. So I I think he's going to Cleveland. And so does Gerald. So does Joe. And so does everybody else. But then all of a sudden. Kobe Bryant gets on the phone and t- tells him, you're not going to sign with Cleveland, bro. You come to play with the Lakers. You can play with me rather than play against me. And he convinced Ron Artest to sign with the Lakers. Now, flash forward. It's, 20, it's 2011. I thought it was the other way around. I thought uh, no. when Ron Artest came into the shower, he came into uh, the shower. He came into where Kobe Bryant had just taken a shower. And no, he went in. He went in. Yeah. He went he in. Went in after he went in. He went yeah. in. Okay. Yeah. Well, he went in, and then he said, I, "I'm going to come and help you." It was more of him approaching the idea to Kobe as opposed to Kobe approaching the idea to Meta. The Wars. the yeah yeah that 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 part is true, but he wasn't a free agent at that time. He was okay. still under contract. Okay. Well, I mean, that's he, how the story is told by yes. Meta World Peace, is that yes, he facilitated 100%. the offer. Yes, the, you're right, shower. Gerald. He did. Yes, which he is, did. You know, the, the, important, the important part about that whole process is understanding how big that transaction was for the Lakers. Ron Artest was solely brought in for that last series that year. Trevor Ariza was great in 09, and he would have been great in the first semis and in the Western Conference Finals. But Paul Where, Pierce was a physical Paul small Pierce forward. was what we were waiting for in the finals. And his old, and if, if, if our test did not contain him for all but one game in that series, we are not looking at the Lakers winning that series as of right now. Metal World Peace, everyone talks about the three-point shot in Game 7. Uh-uh. And his performance in Game 7. Yes, his 20 points were huge. But that guy's defense <laughs> for six of those seven games was what won us the game. That, that, and him kneeing Ray Allen when Ray Allen broke that playoff record from three in Game 2 in L.A. by kneeing giving probably Ray Allen the biggest Charlie horse in NBA history where Ray Allen was never right after that. He went, he he subsequently went 0 for 10 from the three point line. Exactly. Ron Artest 
If he's not a Laker in 2010, the Lakers lose to the Celtics in the finals. So let me ask you this before we head to the final question I have and, and I'll wrap it up because we've got less than five minutes. Should Ron Artest be considered for the Hall of Fame? Do you think he is deserving of a Hall of Fame spot because of the highs and lows of his career? No. I think I, I think I think half the people that have been getting in the Hall of Fame don't belong in the Hall of Fame. I I would say I don't think so, Gerald. I don't I don't think so. Um, however, um, shouldn't be lost. He's definitely one of the most colorful characters that the NBA has had probably in the last He's thirty. One of the years. greatest def- uh, defenders. defenders of this century. Yeah. Um, I'll just in, put that in, on the queue. In in all honesty. He he did win a defensive player of the year award. That's that's unquestioned. He probably should have won two, actually. Um, but that's another story for another day. Uh yeah, definitely. Uh as far as perimeter defenders go in the last 30 years, he's definitely in the top I think, 10. I think the NBA needs to make their own Hall of Fame, but I don't know if that's ever gonna happen. I the the dra- the 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 NBA is a completely different league than any league that's ever existed in basketball. It is the most highly touted. I mean, it's so, so much better than any league ever that they should have their own Hall of Fame. And NBA Hall of Fame is how I my mind thinks of players. I know certain players like Vlade, Arvidas Sabonis had great international careers, but I'm sorry, guys. If you've spent most the majority of your time in the NBA, you should be judged off your NBA stats, not your international stuff. And I'm not the right guy to ask this question. I am snobbish about who makes it in the Hall of Fame. You have to almost not even ask the question. You know, you got to be quick, okay? Joe Montana, yes. Tom Brady, yes. Peyton Manning, yes. Fred Taylor. Mm-hmm. As soon as you get that pause... No. Tracy McGrady, Grant Hill. Pause. Kobe Bryant, Steve Nash. Check it. Shaquille O'Neal. Easy, quick, easy. It's got to be quick, guys. It can't be, oh, uh, 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 uh. If you're going, uh, 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 you're not a Hall of Famer. That's supposed to be the elite of the elite. And there were some elite talent. Unfortunately, just did not mesh together with the 2012 Lakers. Uh, Unfortunately, a afternote a footnote in the history of the los angeles lakers and what should have been a history making team unfortunately was history for altogether different reasons once again it's lakers history 101 with professor sean grice and professor joe sorrow it's two minutes left before class and the bell is ringing guys i want to go ahead and thank tj johnson for bringing up today's subject and suggesting today's topic for you guys to lecture on i'm hoping i'll get a chance to talk to him a little bit more about it in the coming days and weeks and maybe i'll be able to post that here but before we head on out the turn is now one of yours on the next subject so i ask you guys who wants to choose and what's the next subject because joshua Dietz, one of our brightest students is asking what he needs to go ahead and read and study up on for the next lecture Uh, you know what? We're we're going to go ahead and uh, have a great discussion about Towelgate. Okay. Robert, how that led to Robert Ori and Danny Ainge changed the trajectory of the Los Angeles Lakers <laughs> it's forever. So big. For those who don't know this, that towel changed NBA history in not just Laker history. Danny Ainge's career. Phoenix Suns career uh, franchise. I'm taught where. So if you guys really want to. The Lakers, of course. The Lakers. I already said that. Gee, did you not hear me? Well, you kind of were stressing out on other parts. Your, your, yes. your glasses are crooked. Maybe you didn't hear me right. Sir, professor, I heard you clearly, sir. <laughs> yes, uh, Lakers. It definitely changed the Lakers' trajectory. Is that is that correct? Tra- tra- trajectory. Go. So that's what we'll talk about. That's the required homework and reading for every one of our students out there. Once again, it's Lakers Fast Break University, Lakers History 101. So Joshua, Petting, Blue, Jamie, everybody that was a part of our great conversation. Alan, 
Thanks so much. Also, some great thoughts out there from everyone out there. Truly appreciate it. Lifted had some great comments as well. Thanks so much to everyone that was a part of our class today. The bell's about to ring, so if you have any questions for us, hit us up at Lakers Fast Break on wherever you get your social media or right here on YouTube. We will answer it in according time, but go ahead and for, don't forget, we will be back on Sunday for our Lakers Fast Break live watch party. Uh, Blue Magic is proud to be our pupil at Lakers Fast Break <laughs> University, so we thank you so much. We'll take your obviously all the tuition money that we can get but before we go ahead and let it on out you just let you know that it is playback.tv slash lakers fast break i'm kidding blue i'm kidding blue but playback.tv slash lakers fast break also as well after the game which starts at 6 30 on sunday it is of course our post game right here at the lakers fast break so please go ahead and watch that but for professor joe soro professor sean grice aka the magic man this is your dean, Gerald Glassford from Lakers Fast Break University. Thank you so much for watching and listening. Class is now dismissed. <laughs>